Hi everyone. So you're welcome today once more to our physics content. You are still on Best Science Rain YouTube channel. If you're not subscribed to the channel or you are seeing the channel for the first time, very first time. So you do well by going to the channels near Best Science Brain, written above the channel. You see the subscription button or the subscription icon in the form of a tiny bell. Tap on the bell only once and get subscribed. When you get subscribed, you've seen our videos, our tutorial videos on chemistry, further maths, physics, solution to past questions, examination questions from time to time. So we we'll now go to scholars. So this topic is meant for those in SS1 and SS2, that are senior secondary one and senior secondary two. In high in secondary schools. It's also meant for those who are offering further mathematics in secondary school and for those who are poor in physics and in higher institutions. So we we'll now start with scholars. We're going to start from the SS1 as for this topic and then we'll move over to the SS2 as for this topic. So we we'll go start with scholars for SS1 students. So scholars are quantities. In physics, that have only magnitude or size, they don't have any direction. So, scholars are quantities that have only magnitude or size in physics, but have no direction. Just like when somebody says, Yes, scholar, the person is not saying any good thing about you. Yes, scholar means that you have size, you have no direction. It's more like you're causing somebody says somebody is a scholar. So, I prefer to be called a vector than to be called a scholar. So scalar quantities are one that have magnitude or size and have no direction. Now what are the examples of scalar quantities? Sometimes students start memorizing examples because it's, it's very easy to know. The scalar quantities are, the first example are the fundamental quantities or the base quantities that are all scalar. They include mass, which is scalar, a fundamental quantity is mass, is fundamental and scalar. Distance, when we talk about distance, anything that has to do with distance, uh, length, breadth, height, radius, and diameter. They are all different forms of distances, so they are all scalar. Time is fundamental, time is also scalar. Temperature is fundamental, temperature is also scalar. Current is fundamental, but someone may argue that current has direction. Then why is current scalar? Current is scalar because current is the dot product of two vectors. So dot product of two vectors will give you scalar. Amount is also scalar. Luminous intensity is also scalar. So these are seven major, seven main fundamental quantities under all scalars. Now, are there scalar quantities under, are there derived quantities that are scalar? Yes. Some derived quantities are scalar. Let's move on to the other side of the world. Some derived quantities are scalar, which includes speed. Speed is derived by using the formula distance over time. Speed is scalar. Area is also derived. Length times breadth is scalar. Volume is derived, length by breadth by height is scalar. Lady potential is scalar. Gravitational potential is scalar. Density, which is mass over volume, is scalar. Work and energy, which is force times distance, is scalar. That is work or energy formula. Power is scalar. Now, we have issues here. How do we know that a fundamental quantity is, and a derived quantity is scalar? Let's move to speed. In most of the derived quantities are scalar. In their formula, you only miss scalars in the formula. Like to get speed, you use distance over time. So both distance and time are scalar. That means you use scalar. To get area, you have length times breadth. Both length and breadth are forms of distances. That means area scalar also. You go to volume. In volume, length times breadth times height. The three items are scalar. That means this one scalar. Go to density. In density, both mass and volume for calculating volume density is scalar, and that means density is scalar. And so, although there are exemption, like when you come to work, force is there, and when you go to power, you also have um, work in power. So, these are examples of scalars, quantities in physics that have magnitude but no direction.
So we'll move over to vectors. Vectors in physics are quantities that have both magnitude of size and directions. So vectors have both magnitude and directions. Examples of vectors are displacement is a vector. Velocity is a vector. Acceleration is a vector. Force is a vector. Impulse is a vector. Momentum is a vector. Moment is a vector. Electric, magnetic, and gravitational fields are vectors. Then let's look at these examples we have. Why are they vectors? They have uh, both sides and directions. Then we are seeing that most scalars that are vectors are mostly derived quantities. We also look that we saw that some scalars are derived quantities, like area is scalar, which is length times breadth. And I made it clear that a trick to know whether a derived quantity is scalar is by looking at looking at the um, the formula. The, the, in the formula, the quantity used to, to obtain that scalar must also be scalars, although there are few exemptions. Now, coming to vectors, for a, a derived quantity to be a vector, in this formula, like if find velocity, velocity is displacement over time. So in this formula, one of the quantities must be a vector. That will make it a vector. Like in velocity, displacement is a vector, even though time is scalar. That made this one a vector. Acceleration is velocity over time. In acceleration, velocity is a vector, even though time is scalar. So that made this one a vector. Force is mass times acceleration. In the formula for force, acceleration is vector, even though mass is scalar. That makes force a vector. And when we talk about force, there are different kinds of forces. We have a pull. We have push, we have tension, we have weight, we have up thrust, we have viscous force, all these, we have electric force, we have force field anyway, uh, or field forces. All these are different types of forces and they are considered as vectors. You come to impulse, impulse is force times time. Even though time is scalar, Force is vector, that makes impulse vector. So we have momentum. Momentum is mass times velocity. Even though mass is scalar, velocity is vector, that makes momentum vector. You go to moment. Moment is force times distance. So even though distance is scalar, force is vector, that makes moment vector. So let's go back to the beginning. What I'm trying to say is for you to recognize a vector easily, you look at the formula for obtaining a vector, you may have two or three quantities for, for obtaining the vector. In velocity, you have displacement and time. Provided one of the quantities in the formula is a vector, that will likely make this quantity to be a vector. So you look at this two, one is scalar, one is vector. So this velocity become a vector because you have a vector here. Acceleration, velocity is vector, time is scalar. Because velocity is vector, that means acceleration vector. Go to force. Mass is scalar. For the fact that acceleration is vector, that makes force a vector. So when two quantities or three quantities are used to obtain a vector, provided one of them is a vector quantity, that makes that quantity a vector. In scalars, when two quantities are used to obtain a scalar, like in area, length times breadth, the length and breadth are both scalar. That will see make the area scalar. Volume, length times breadth times height. Volume is length times breadth times height. The three are scalar. That means this one is scalar. But for a vector, if one of the quantities to obtain the vector, vector is a vector, like moment is a vector, force is a vector, that means one vector. So it is the fact that distance is scalar.
doesn't matter. Although there are few exemptions of uh, like walk. Walk is false time distance. Walk is scalar, even though false is scalar. So energy is also false time distance. Force is scalar. If energy, if energy remains scalar, the exemptions to this rule will come to scalar quantities. So we are giving a list of a comprehensive list of uh, so many scalars and vector quantities. force on this boss 
The total force is obtained by taking the difference between the two forces. It could be either F1 minus F2 or it could be either F2 minus F1. F1 minus F2 if F1 is greater than F2. Or F2 minus F1 if F2 is higher than F1. So when two vectors are acting in opposite direction, to find the resultant, we take the difference between the two vectors. The one will subtract each or the one that will subtract the other depends on the one on the magnitude. The higher one will subtract the, the smaller value. Let us look at this example here. For instance, we have this situation. This is 15 newton, while this is 10 newton. We are now asked to find the resultant force on this system. Resultant force now become 15 minus 10, you know, 5 newton, but it now has due east. Because look at the cardinal point. Here is your east, here is your west. Had it been that the boss were moving like this, it would have been due west. Okay? The other case too, or second example is when two vectors are parallel to each other. When two vectors are parallel to each other, they lie parallel to each other. When we say that vectors are parallel to each other, it means when the angle between them is zero. So, when two forces or vectors lie parallel to each other and they are acting in the same direction, that is when we have maximum resultant. So, maximum resultant occurs when two vectors act parallel to each other. So the resultant force now is obtained by adding the two forces together. Now I have F1 plus F2. F1 plus F2. When they are, are don't subtract anymore, we now add together. For instance, we have this situation, a force of 5 Newton and a force of 3 Newton. The resultant force on this boss or this uh, material becomes 5 plus 3. That gives us 8 Newton balls. Now, due is since the movement is due east. So, the third case we're going to have is the third case is when the vectors are mutually perpendicular to each other. That is case 3. Case 3 is when two vectors are mutually perpendicular to each other. So when the two vectors are perpendicular to each other, how do we find the resultant? When we say that two vectors are perpendicular, that means when the angle between them is 90 degrees, they act at right angle to each other. When the angle between them is 90 degrees. So to find the resultant, we apply the Pythagoras theory in mathematics. What do we do? We try to make a sketch of a rectangle if the vectors are not equal or a square if they are equal vectors we put an arrow the arrow here signifies vector anyway so let me here is 3 newton and here is 4 newton so these two vectors are mutually perpendicular the angle between them is 90 the vertical line and the horizontal line so how do I find the resultant of these two vectors I will draw a a diagonal from the point of intersection of vectors. I'll draw a straight line or a diagonal. Then if here is 3, this place is also 3. If this place is 4, this other line is also 4. Because I will form a rectangle. Resultant now becomes the diagonal. That is our resultant force here. Then to find the resultant, let me call this A, B, C, and D. That is angle here. So, for to find the resultant force, what do I do? I'll consider one of the triangles, probably triangle C, A, D. There will be an angle here called theta. We can look at triangle C, A, D. How about the triangle C, A, D? So, I'll take the, this is the right angle triangle. So, to solve this, I'll apply Pythagoras theorem. Where FR, that AC, which is FR, is the hypotenuse. So hypotenuse square will now become the opposite square, that is 3 square plus adjacent square using the Pythagoras theorem. 
So the resultant square becomes 3 squared plus 4 squared gives us 25. Our FR becomes square root of 25, which gives us 5 newtons. So the resultant of these two forces is 5 newtons. Um, the resultant is a vector, so and vectors have direction. So when you find the resultant, you find the angle, angle between the resultant with any of the vector. Let's look for this angle theta. Between the resultant and the 4 newton force, you find the angle. You can as well find the angle between the resultant and the 3 newton for that angle that is here. So any of them can be used or can substitute. So to find this angle theta here, we apply three ratios. This is the right angle triangle. This side, basically this angle is called the, the opposite. While this side is called the adjacent. The longest side is called the hypotenuse. This is the hypotenuse. This is the opposite because it's facing angle theta. While this is the adjacent. So if I apply the three ratio, which is so called two. So the most appropriate three ratio to apply here is tan. Because tan is opposite over adjacent. Combine this and that. So this is the opposite and this is the adjacent. We now say tan theta equal to 3 over 4. So when you solve this, you're going to have 0 0.75. So you find theta. Theta now becomes tan inverse of 0 0.75. And then you find tan inverse of this and that becomes your angle here. So the time in that for zero point seven five will give us approximately. Point nine degrees, 36.9 degrees here. So that's the angle between the resultant and the 4 newton force here. So we can now say that our resultant is 5 newton acting at 36.9 degrees, acting at the angle here, what would it obtain? 36.9 degrees to the 4 newton force. The resultant is 5 newton based on our calculation earlier on, acting at 36.9 degrees to the 4 newton force. So the fourth case now is to find resultant of two vectors using what we call the pyrogram law of vectors. Case 4. Where we involve the pyrogram law of vectors. Which says that if two vectors are represented in both magnitude and directions by the adjacent sides of a parallelogram. Then their resultant is represented in both magnitude and direction by the diagonal of the parallelogram drawn from the point of intersection of the vectors. So we'll go through this statement again. It's a long statement, but it is a reasonable statement. 
He said that if two vectors are represented in both magnitude and direction by the adjacent size of a parallelogram, then the resultant is presented in both magnitude and direction by the diagonal of the, of the parallelogram drawn from the point of intersection of the two vectors. Then when we apply the parallelogram of vectors, we apply this formula where the angle between the vectors is not equal to 90 degrees. Either the angle is more than 90 or the angle is less than 90 degrees. So this is applied when the angle between the two vectors is not more than 90 degrees. It's not up to 90, not equal to 90, either less than 90, like angle of 60 degree, angle of 30 degree, or more than 90, like angle of 120, or angle of 150 degrees. Then we have a simplified formula for this. Or before I go to the formula to, uh, to evaluate this, the program law of vectors, let's look at the schematic diagram of this. So for us to present two vectors by this uh, program law of vectors, we we'll first of all draw a parallelogram. A figure with uh, parallel, opposite sides, parallel and equal, we we'll draw a parallelogram. Then let the pair vector here be F1, one vector here, call it F2. So this side is parallel and equal to this side. Why this side is parallel and equal to the other side. So we'll draw the diagonal. The diagonal represents the resultant force. And then the angle between the two vectors, F1 and F2, let's call the angle theta. So this theta represents the angle between F1 and F2. And that theta is not equal to 90 degrees. Now to find the vector here A, B, C, and D. To find the resultant, how do I go about it? Find the resultant, I use a shortcut formula that says F arrow square equal to F1 square plus F2 squared plus 2 times F1 times F2 cos of the angle between them. So the formula looks like cosine root. F1 square, except that we change the minus sign here to plus sign. F1, that is the first vector. F2, square vector. The sphere of the vector added together plus 2 times the product. 2 times F1 times F2. Then cos of theta. Theta is the angle between F1 and F2. So the next, we're going to look at a problem that involves uh, parallelogram law of vectors or angles less than 90 or more than 90 